Okay, welcome to the TNT Boxing Podcast. I'm your host, TNT Tomlinson, and I'm here with my co-host, Iron Bar Boxing, and today we have a very special guest here with us. He was the former IBF junior middleweight champion of the world, once held the record for being the youngest junior middleweight champion. His record as an amateur is 105-0, and his record as a pro is 32-3-2. He fought boxing legends like Wilfred Benitez and Vito Antefermo. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Hilton. Hey, hello everybody. <laughs> Hi Matthew, how are you doing? Great, how are you doing? Good. Um, what made you want to start boxing? Well, it was a kind of a family tradition. One followed another. I had two older brothers, Davy and Alec, and then they were boxing. Alec followed Davy, and then I followed Alec. So it was just kind of tradition. One copy of the other. Um, what was your childhood kind of like? It was kind of rough because uh, we're kind of there wasn't much to be done in boxing in Montreal in those days. So my father had a real hard time. He had five boys and one girl, and uh, it was kind of rough growing up, you know. But uh, don't ask me how, but he did it and survived. <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking of that, Dave Elton Senior. Um, he held like the Canadian Championship in three different divisions: featherweight, welterweight, and light middleweight. I heard something about your dad fighting in every division from featherweight to heavyweight. Is that true? Absolutely true. That, that's great. Well, he would take fights anywhere. You know, the, at the end they were kind of using them. They'd send them anywhere: South Africa, anywhere, Jamaica. He, he went every, everywhere as an opponent. So it was kind of hard. Like he went through the rough times. Um, so besides your dad, Matthew, who were some of the, the fighters that you admired growing up? Um, I, uh, ha- of course, I'd have to say my father. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was a big, big fan of Roberto Duran. Oh, he's a great one. Yeah, I was a great fan of his. And you know, the worst thing is this is off the record. But, well, it, it doesn't really matter, but I, I'm just talking. I, it almost happened that I fought him. Well, you guys, it was the perfect time, right? Because it was yeah. the mid '80s. He was a light middleweight. Middleweight. Exactly. He beat uh, Davy Moore in '83. I think he fought uh, he fought to uh, Hagler in '83, and then of course Hearns got to him in '84. '84. That's right. Yeah, I don't really recall that, but I just remember they were. It was in the book of me getting ready to fight. That would have been I amazing. That would be an honor just to meet him. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned something, something about your dad. Um, what was it like going on the road with your dad and your whole family during his pro career? Well, it was like work, actually. Uh, like work, uh, I've got to go do my job. Hmm. And that's what we did. Did our job. See, we lived all our life in Quebec. And uh, it was kind of hard because everybody, we had a reputation and nobody would fight us, so we had to go... My poor father, and we didn't have no financial means, and my father would drive for miles. In those days, uh, uh, near Toronto and Ontario was more active than in Montreal. Now, you guys had like a trailer set up for, for all this stuff too, is that true? Yep, yep. But did your dad put that together? I guess that wouldn't be something that came off the lot at Canadian Tire. Uh, exactly, <laughs> right? exactly, uh, my, you're exactly right. I mean, you know what a medicine ball is? Yeah. Well, that, my poor dad would hold it for every one of us. That was our punching bag. Jeez. Wow. Um, and um, speaking of that, like for your whole childhood, like boxing was in your family. Like your brothers were boxers as well as your father. How much did that help you become such an amazing fighter? To tell you the truth, it helped me because Davey and Alec, they're both, I followed, and I did try not to make the same mistakes as they did, so I kind of learned from them, actually. I don't do what he did, and then I had a second time, don't do what Alec did, so, you know, unless I was that stupid. (laughs) Well, it's, you know what, I only figured out how to learn from my mistakes later in life at 49, so it's good that you learn when you're younger. Well, in a a sporting event, you know, it's kind of hard. You learn, especially in boxing. You learn the hard way. Yeah, it's the school of, uh, of hard knocks. Exactly, yep. Okay. So I read that your father pulled you and your brothers out of 
high school, like to turn professional as teenagers, and you guys never really went to school because in Davy Senior's eyes, it wouldn't give you guys enough time to develop into boxers. Looking back, do you feel like this helped or hindered you in your career or life after boxing? Um, I think absolutely it helped. Uh, boxing is a very, very dedicated sport, and you got to give it. You got to just put one foot in and one foot out. You got to have both feet in there all the way. It's a hard, hard sport. No kidding. So, uh, Matthew, you have to do the schooling and everything. It's hard to get it, fit everything in there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, you were a great amateur. Um, you know, you had an undefeated record of 105. And oh, and you turned pro in '83. But the Olympics were just the next year. So why didn't you stay another year in the amateurs to compete in the '84 Olympics? Well, it was just during there that time. It was kind of easy to make my decision because that was, I believe, '84. Yeah. And I, I will tell you the truth. I was very thrilled to go to the Olympics. I wanted to go to the Olympics, but then I had 104 fights up to that time. 104 or 105 fights up to that time. And they decided to make this new rule, and my father had been in my corner of 104, uh, right. 105 fights, and uh, it was very easy. I, I didn't feel comfortable without my father being in the most important aspect of my life. Okay, makes sense. And when researching for this podcast, I found an article that mentioned you lived with Tyson in Catskills for a bit. What was yeah. that like? Actually, we, we brought Mike, uh, we, we stayed there, well, we had connections, it was, we were living with Mike, nobody ever knew of Mike, but uh, the reason we went over there and he happened to be there was Custy Amato was our trainer. What was it like getting, uh, interacting and getting trained by, by Cus? Uh, well, you know, to tell you the truth, I, you might pick some things off him this and that, but I, my, we are already developed our style, and uh, you know, there's nothing really Cus could have done to uh, make our careers better. I don't believe that. This is completely my opinion, but there's nothing he could have done to uh, improve anything about us. Our styles and everything were already developed. You'd been doing that since you were a little kid, and those smokers when you were like just a little guy. Yeah, exactly. So you, you See, my, my dad did that all, all himself as well. He, like, we were in New York. He brought us to different places that just to be in the gyms around fighters. That we get the, the smell of it, the smell of the gyms, the, the sweat. Right, right, yeah. And you have fought some great fighters in your career, boxing legends. Out of all the fighters that you fought, who do you have the most respect for? Um, it's hard to say. I, I actually, uh, I would be lying. I respected everybody in my own way, in their own way. I respected anybody. Uh, obviously, Wilfred Benitez and Vito Antofermo would come up first, right? And of course, Buster Drayton, who I won the title off of. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a tough, underrated guy. I think. Yeah. Oh, very tough. Yes. I mean, I thought. Well, we'll probably deal with this later, but it was just such a great fight. But Patrick's going to ask yeah. you about the Antifermo and Benitez. Yeah. yeah, you fought. You were 19 years old when you fought Vito Antifermo and 20 years old when you fought Wilfred Benitez. Both of these fighters were highly regarded and still are. They're former world champions, and you were so young when you fought them. Going into these fights, were you intimidated by their resumes and reputations? I was never intimidated, no. But everywhere, it was like I was the star. They walked into the the Montreal Paul Sauvé or Montreal Forum, and it was like it was me the star. The crowd went out of their minds, so it was like I was the star. So no, I wasn't. I can't say intimidated at all. Oh, and what was it like to fight Wilfred Benitez? An honor, a real honor, being in there with a three-time world champion. And how tough was Vito Antofermo? Because he's sort of a scary-looking guy, too. He looks like somebody... You know, this is off the record, but uh, <laughs> I know I talked to him on the phone the other day. It's the first time since I fought him. No way. You did? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. I got his phone number in my pocket. Uh, I don't know how a friend of a friend or whatever, and he 
he wanted to talk, and I spoke to him yesterday, actually. That's really cool. You're getting a busy week here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, that's great. But yeah, to tell you the truth, he's got to be the toughest. That I, just toughness. I hit him with everything and didn't budge. The skin broke, but he didn't. Exactly. He exactly. Was never knocked out. I don't think he was ever knocked out. I might have been uh, knocked down. I don't down. think so either. I mean, cuts, right? That was his, his downfall. You'd have to kill that man in the ring. Uh, he, you will not put him down. Oh, wow. Kind of... Oh, wait. So, uh, Matthew, you started boxing, so you're really young, about five. And it yeah. was your, your dad's dream, and probably mm -hmm. your dream too, but it was your dad's dream to see one of his sons become world champ. And how did you feel after they read those scorecards and you were the new uh, IBF champ and you were the first Canadian world champ in almost six decades. So what was that uh, like? You know, I didn't really care about all that history. Ever, ever since I was a little kid, I used to dream about hearing those words, the new world champion. I just, that's all I ever, I didn't want money, I didn't want nothing. I just wanted to be to have that title world champion. And thank God I got, and it's very rare somebody gets their goal and I got my goal at 21 years old. I wanted to be world champion, and I did. Amazing. Yeah. And when looking back at some of your fights, I noticed Jimmy Ellis in your corner. Yeah. What was yep. your relationship with Jimmy like, and what was it like having someone like the former heavyweight champ Jimmy Ellis in your corner? Well, again, that was my father's connections, and we run into to Jimmy Ellis uh, several times on the road. The different fight. I believe the first time I ran into him was in Buffalo, uh... Yeah, I believe it was in Buffalo. And uh, he just kind of grew on to us. And then my dad asked him, did he want to come into our team? And uh, Jimmy was right there. Or I, I believe his son was my one of my sparring partners. Wow. And, so, and um, for a while, you were a star athlete in the province of Quebec and packed venues like the Montreal Forum. How would you mentally prepare yourself for fighting in front of so many fans? Well, you know, to tell you the truth, it just, it, it was the challenge of being there. I, I didn't really care about the fans and all that. I, of course, it helped being, you know, having them behind you encouraging. But I just, I knew what I wanted. I was lucky at a young age. I knew what I wanted. So when I was a teenager, we went to the, you know, we, I didn't have pay-per-view or anything like that. So uh, I went out to... Uh, the racetrack near my house in the country where I lived and they were showing uh, the fight card where you fought uh, Iron Man Jack Callahan on the Mike Tyson undercard. Right. So that must have been exciting. That was a huge fight. That was a history making fight card, you know. First defense of your title. First defense of your title. So what was that night like? Um, to tell you the truth, great honor being on the undercard of Mike Tyson. But uh, like I said, I didn't really cared that much. I cared about my Canadian fans and doing what I could for Canada. And uh, I think I did my part. Amazing. So like I mentioned earlier, you trained since age five and that IBF title was very important to you. What was going through your mind once you found out you lost the decision and your world title to Robert Hines in 1988? Uh, it's kind of hard. I knew I wasn't ready for the fight. I was injured prior to the fight. I should have listened to my father. I was hurt with my ribs, and my dad said, let's go home. And I, just, I figured I could get him. You almost and had him. Listened, so, and you know, you, everybody knows what happened. Oh, and like, speaking of the rib injury, could you like walk us through like exactly how that rib, rib, rib I'm sorry, exactly how that rib injury occurred? I was struggling with my weight, so maybe that had something to do with it. I was starving myself. But uh, I, I was during a sparring match with a guy that wasn't really a big puncher at all. And uh, I felt it go into my, into my stomach. And uh, I, I cut the wind completely off me. And he was no puncher whatsoever who I was boxing with. So, uh, and you came over in a few, like, five pounds over the, the junior middleweight limit before that title defense, or you were, you had about 24 hours to lose five pounds and then fight to keep your world championship. So how did you lose that much weight, and how did that affect your performance, do you think? To tell you the truth, I don't think it really affected my performance. Uh, I, again, uh, lack 
of discipline. I, I, you know, I got nobody to blame but myself. Lack of discipline. I should have been by the most one pound over. Never mind five pounds. And and the way of getting losing the weight, I, I went running, jogging in the park. You know, where I had no business the same day as the fight. That'll tire you out. And um, well, and what is your dream fight? If you could fight any fighter from any era, who would that be? Of course, the fight in my my idol, Roberto Duran. That would be a great fight. Yeah, that would be amazing. So I uh, I heard somewhere that you sparred Doug Dewitt a few years before the two of you fought uh, for the title. How did that go? Uh, yeah, I sparred with. I was in New York City uh, at the time, and I sparred with Doug uh, two times. Cool. Or um, see, I, it's been so long ago. I'm not quite remember him. He didn't want to spar. Didn't want to spar with us anymore. Hmm. You must have worked him over a little bit. The body. He didn't yeah. like it there. Um. So on January fifteenth, nineteen ninety, you got another shot at the world title when you fought Doug Dewitt for the WBO middleweight title. That title was. That fight was stopped at the end of the 11th round, and because of that fight, you suffered a retina injury. Looking back, do you think that fight should have been stopped earlier? Um, I think I was winning, but uh, who knows? My dad made the decision, and he probably made the right decision, because I had no business being there in the 11th round with Doug Dewitt. I, I should have stopped that fight a, long, a lot earlier. I should have stopped Doug. And, and uh, you and know... He wasn't at his prime either. He was still a very tough guy, though. Yeah. Yes. And you were, your eyes were already busted up a little from the, I think it was Furman Chirino yeah. draw. But it, but it wasn't really from that fight. It, it, it was, it, I was taking, like I said, I was struggling with weight. I was taking these kind of pills for, not, and I don't know if that's what made it swell up. But uh, I remember when I got hit in the eye, it hurt. Okay. hurt like hell. So I love when you swelled both swelled up like in seconds. Yeah, it looked like you were stung by a bee. Or yeah. two, two bees. Yeah. And well, yeah. well, I didn't. So I loved what you did in the fifth and sixth rounds of the the wit fight. You did yeah. everything a fighter in your position should do. You covered up and protected your right eye. When you had a chance, you landed some good punches and the wit barely landed anything. I just wanted to comment kind of on that. Yeah. So, Matthew, so you said, like, after winning the title, I mean, it's such a huge high, and, you know, you lost uh, you, some of your motivation and, and some of the discipline that had got you there. And, and you, know, you know, the worst thing is, uh, is uh, Patrick, right? Yeah. Yep. Is that your name, Patrick? Patrick yeah. and Pete. So the old voice is Peter, and the young one is Patrick. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, Peter. Uh, Don't worry. I took you for Patrick. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, it's... it's, it's it all comes to the same thing. I didn't listen to what I was told. I haven't got nothing to say. It all came to I didn't listen. You know, that's good advice for everybody. Yeah. Because... You know, you, who's been there, you listen, and they'll, they'll tell you what. Because what exactly my father had told me did happen. Every to a T almost. Well, there you go. If it happened to Fa him, I don't know. Father knows best. Yep. Besides being besides beating Drayton and winning that world title, well, what is your favorite moment from your boxing career? My favorite what? Your favorite moment from your boxing career? Obviously, is winning the title. When I heard the the announcement and the new, obviously I. And and what about? Like I said, I didn't care about money or anything. I just wanted that title name, uh, champion of the world. And what was your second favorite moment? Do you have a second favorite moment? I'm trying to think. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. What was the toughest fight of your career? Well, that's kind of easy. It's probably winning the title because it meant so much to me. Uh, that It's hard to say your toughest, but that was the one that meant so much for me. So it's probably that one. And it was a 15-round fight, right? I mean, that's exactly. amazing. And it went 15. And it went 15, and they didn't do 15 rounds for much longer after that. Exactly, yeah. I, I believe that. I'm not sure if that was, was the last one, or... It's, I don't remember any fights after that. Yeah, it's got to be one of the last ones. Yeah, and yeah. I remember your other fights after right, your first two defenses. They were 12-round fights. They were scheduled for 12. Yeah, I don't remember any 
15 rounders after that, but uh, I'd be lying if I said it. It's a long time ago. Um, so I noticed that in many of your fights, you wore tartan boxing shorts. Was yeah. there a reason behind that? Yes, because we're of Scottish descent. And uh, that's the trunks I always wore, was the, the Royal Stuart tartan. Those are those are the greatest looking shorts, I think. That's like uh, iconic, like the Montreal Canadiens logo. <laughs> like yeah. the Montreal Canadiens. For me, well, anyway, right? Pardon me. For me, that's like an amazing look. Yeah. It's like well, it was. It was. It had more to do with. Never mind the look. It had more to do with uh, tradition. And that's beautiful. So some fighters later become friends with their opponents. You Nobody mentioned... knew people that are not Scottish. They're wondering. What kind of shorts are they? I got comments a lot on they, my shorts. They thought they were the Hudson's Bay or something yeah. like that. Or <laughs> Stupid d- jokes like that. Dominion. Yeah. yeah, and some fighters later become friends with their opponents. You mentioned earlier, like, you you and Vito Fermo co- contacting each other. Besides that, do you have any? Did, did you come into contact with any of the fighters that you fought? Um, actually, not really. Because like I had told you before, most of my my fights after uh, after signing with Don King, I'd probably say they were all in the states. Where it was all all my bigger fights were all American. So uh, no, I, I'm not really in contact with nobody. And um, what advice would you give to a young pro fighter today? The advice I would is. I would get is listen to your trainer who was ever out for you and get out as soon as possible I think that's good advice yeah and what do you think is the most important skill in boxing pardon me what do you think is the most important skill in boxing most important skill probably defense that makes sense and I, I don't like his style but I gotta take take it up my hat off to him he's got down to a tear is that Floyd Mayweather Jr. yeah yeah he's he's on fire he's for defense he, I, I don't like his, that kind of style but my god he you can't hit him no it's not exciting to watch but it certainly is effective right exactly yeah and, and he still made like tens and, and tens and that's the object of boxing he yeah. hit and not get hit yeah so you can't say I can't say nothing about him I'm not a fan of his but that's the object of boxing. That's the yeah. respect. So for a while now... I five cents to go see him, but... <laughs> yeah, so for a while now, I've been wanting to know the answer to this question. What's going through a boxer's mind in between rounds? In between rounds? What, is, what would go through mine is what exactly I'm going to do. So you would actually stop and, not, and think about strategy and... You or have, do I keep up? what I'm doing well you got your corner in there talking to you and it's kind of hard for me to comment on that because you got your corner in there telling you my, like in me in my sense it's my father yeah but uh in telling you what to do they get your corner can see more than you can see inside right. they're on the outside so they can see in I guess okay um how do you feel about today's era of pro fighters Pardon me? Uh, how, how do you feel about today's era of pro fighters? Um, well, I find it's changed so much. Uh, now it's all about money. Uh, I, it's, I, I find that there's so much money. Like, I'm not knocking him. He probably deserves everything he gets. But Mayweather Jr., I mean, there's so much money involved now. I, I don't even find it an interesting sport. And I don't follow it that much either anymore. So, is there any fighter from today or maybe history who you think reminds you of yourself or your style? Uh, not really. Okay. Well, you're pretty unique anyway. Not really. <laughs> well, although, you know, I get a lot, and I gotta say, but he looks like me. I don't know what if he fights like me, but is that, what's his, Canelo? Canelo Alvarez. Yeah, yeah that's a good call. Alvarez. Yep. You guys got a similar bot. You guys even got similar coloring. Yeah, a lot of people comment. Hey, he looks like Matthew. Man, that's how I knew him. I said, "Who?" And I looked on the TV. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, he does." That is true. That is true. Yeah. 
How do you feel about fight old fighters coming out of retirement and fighting in exhibitions like Mike Tyson and Roy Jones? Uh, what do I think about that? I think they should. Uh, exhibitions, there's no big deal, like shows and stuff like that. But go out, like I should have. Go out as champion. Go out as people see you, not to see you on the ground or down and kick you while you're down. Uh, go, go out at your best. Don't go out there. Uh, at your lowest yeah and i remember after watching the tyson jones fight like i was like looking forward to just seeing those guys in the ring but after seeing it i realized these guys should not be in the ring like i mean they put on maybe a bit of exciting performance so i just looked at them and just looked like how old they were like they're old worn down bodies and i was like they and definitely shouldn't be in the that ring happen. you always see them and I, I they always come back for it I know, they really do. I mean, you retired and you stay retired. How did you manage to, to stay retired and not come back like everybody else? To, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I, I thought in my mind, I still think in my mind. <laughs> but, uh, and I stayed hanging them up and my days are over and that's how it stayed. Well, that's really good because too many guys come out and it's pretty dangerous for you. Yeah. Exactly. It never ends well, right? The money is never worth the damage. That it's not Your at brain's all. brain's being scrambled. And I got two boys. I don't encourage them. They don't want to know nothing about boxing, but I don't encourage them either. Do they know how famous that you are? Oh, yeah. They read about it on the internet and oh, everything. Oh, cool. But That's very cool. They did, yeah. And I don't push them at all. They come to me, tell me to bring them to the gym. I'll do it, of course. But uh, it's their decision. Yeah. Um, so before we go, is there anything that you'd like to promote, Matthew? Pardon me? Anything you'd like to promote or say hi to anybody? No, nothing at all. Okay, well, you know what? This was just great. It was great talking. Thank you very much for checking out this episode of the TNT Boxing Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the official YouTube channel of the TNT Boxing Podcast.